Uh, like Professor Curry just stated, we uh, developed a River Attributes Monitor and Data Collector, and I'm Devin Wagner. Uh, I'm Ian Tenney. I'm Scott Winger. Um, our overall goal for this design was back in 2008, anyone that lived in the state of Iowa realized the devastating effects of a flood. So the Iowa Flood Center was created. And a lot of what they do is develop and implement ways to measure water, rivers, lakes, and anything that basically has to do with what could possibly happen in the future for flooding. But what they definitely don't do is prevent flooding. So they only want to monitor and maybe predict when a flood might occur. So our goal with this design was to develop a device that could float down the river on its own and measure the water temperature, the air temperature, uh, water flow so you know where the water is flowing. I mean, let's say during a flooding if you put this device out and it's overflowed past a dam or over a bank and water is flowing where it shouldn't be, this device could flow down there and then when you retrieve the device you know where all this water has been flo uh, flowing when it shouldn't have been. Um, and another thing we wanted to do was measure water turbidity. Water turbidity is the clarity of the water. So a lot of times when there is flooding, water clarity will go way down and there might be excess pollutants in the water. When you have excess pollutants in the water, that's never a good thing. And then the last thing is the velocity of the water. I mean, during floods, the most damaging part of the flood is the velocity that it flows at. So we really wanted to monitor that. So we broke down our project into several parts. Uh, we had the enclosure which Scott was in charge of. We had the hardware that Scott was also a part of and I was a part of. And a lot of Scott's um, stuff had to do with powering the system and mine had to do with what the system measured and how everything came together. And then lastly, Ian was in charge of the software part. And his software, we wanted to develop a software program that could take all of our data we collected and graph all that and display it in useful information. We're going to start off with the enclosure. I first had an idea of when it's floating down the river, you don't want any rollover, you don't want a whole lot of movement. So I'd seen these, these are actually bromine uh, dispensers that you put in pools. And they just float around and they have a very weighted bottom and then a light top. So I got some Schedule 40 PVC, constructed it's about two inches, and then it expands to about four inches at the top. That holds our, that holds our electronics. And then Got it to float, and then I optimized how long of a shaft to put on it so that it floats correctly. Got some paint on it, and got to hit up some de decals. So the inside, we have Devin's board, my board, and then the battery, and they fit all in there vertically. And you can see we have little clips, so then the board sets in there and it doesn't move anywhere. It's very secure. And over here we have a actually an access hatch. So then you can get in there and you can get to the charger, the SD card, programming pins. And then on top of that we also have the GPS antenna with an LED and an on-off switch. Then also on the side of the drifter we have to have uh, the mounting of the fiber optics for the water clarity. And I use these screw keyholes right here that come out and De Devin will talk more about that exactly how it works with the fiber optics. Then if you look down the hole in here, you can see where there's counterweights along with the fiber optics that come through the side of the drifter with uh, an epoxy temperature sensor at the very bottom. And now onto my, my power system. The 3.7 volt lithium battery is what we used. powers my board and Devin's board. The aspects of mine is so then we have a, a backup power for in case the battery dies then it'll be able to power our radio that's hooked to a buzzer. So say you just want to deploy it for eight hours, so then you throw it out in the river, go back, you can come back and get your device. You go down and you hit the transmitter and it'll set off this buzzer. So we wanted to have a backup just in case the battery died. Then you can always go out whenever and try to locate it. Granted, if you leave it out for too long, yeah, it'll float too messes it. But, so right here is the supercapacitor charger a very small IC. It's about four millimeters by three millimeters. I had to use a microscope to solder this on. That's why it's on a breakout board. And then that charges the, super, the 22 farad supercapacitors that discharge to a buck boost regulator. 
to power the radio and the buzzer. Then also to charge the battery, we from SmartFun we got the, this USB charger. Let's plug it in and charge it up that, and then it goes right into our system in Devon's Fork. Now Devon will talk about the data acquisition hardware. Um, so for the data acquisition software, we just went with a simple microcontroller. We went with the AT Mega 88PA for a little, the low current of it. And so some of the things that we used with this was we just used a simple green LED, any LED would be fine. But what we did was we put that accessible on the top of the lid. And what we look for with the LED when we're using it is for a GPS lock with the satellite. And also every minute it kind of gives you a little flash to let you know it's still taking measurements. So it lets you know as it's floating down the river if the satellite has been lost, it will turn on. And then every minute it will also flash letting you know that it's still taking measurements. Um, which really came in handy a few times when we tested it because one example was a boat hit it and I really couldn't tell if water had gotten in it or if it was going to sink and the light kept blinking so I knew it was still taking measurements. Um, the other thing we used was we used the Copernicus 2 dip module for our GPS and we used the RX line of the microcontroller and took in the data from the GPS using the TX line and then we also controlled the X standby for the GPS and basically what that lets us do is cut the current poles from 40 milliamps down to 5 milliamps and it basically just turns it on and off but it keeps a lock on the satellite so when you turn it back on it's a quick restart. Um, we used two DS18 B20 temp sensors in our system. One was epoxied into the base which you could kind of see in Scott's picture and that was for measuring water temperature and then the other one was in the top lid of the case which is used for air temperature. And we used a one wire interface for that. So basically for the one wire interface, we read in both addresses of the ds 18 b 20 so we can tell them apart. And then we can communicate with each one individually using one wire. So that saved us a little bit of room on the microcontroller. Next we used a, a DS3231 real-time <laughs> clock. And what that allowed us to do was the GPS has a real-time clock on it. But in case it loses its lock, we write the time when it first gets the lock to the real-time clock, and that real-time clock keeps logging it even if the satellite, or if the GPS becomes unplugged, or if it loses a lock with the satellite. And we use the SCL of the microcontroller to the SCL of the real-time clock and the SDA to the SDA to do the clock and the data communication. Next, we use the ADXL 335 accelerometer. We purchased this from SparkFun, and this is just an accelerometer that uses analog to digital conversion and each pin has a different analog or a different um, voltage on it and if it's at zero G's it's at one voltage and as that changes it changes at a specific rate so all we had to do was read in the voltages average them and we did this every second and once we did that every second then we could use the formula uh, of velocity equals initial velocity plus acceleration times time to determine how fast the water is moving in velocity terms um, we use a simple Hulu 5 volt boost regulator and we control it with two pins because at our 2.8 volt operating system one pin of the microcontroller couldn't supply enough current and all this did was operate our water turbidity sensor which operated at 5 volts so we had to switch up to 5 volts to use that and then we use an open log this was our SD card writing circuit so all of our information is wrote on board to an SD card and then when the device is collected you can take out the SD card and plug it into Ian's stuff and then you can actually look at the information. So that was also controlled by the microcontroller. And then lastly, the water turbidity sensor was controlled as well. And that will go into more detail in these upcoming slides. So here, you can see our entire system. This was my board that I made. And you can see the GPS module and the microcontroller. Now, some people might say, why didn't you go with a surface mount microcontroller? Because it would have saved you space on the board. Well, the pin spacing on a surface mount microcontroller is super small and nothing on your board really gets routed that well. So we just decided to save some time and get a bigger microcontroller in there. But everything spaced out well, and as you can see from the ISP pins and the SD card, we put those vertically so they can be accessed from the top. So here's a little bit more on our water turbidity sensor. It was developed by Professor Anton Kruger at the university, and what it is is it's uh, two fiber optics that point at each other, and we use a microcontroller to send out 320 hertz through an LED. The other fiber optic cable detects that with a photo detector. The signal gets amplified and then inverted and it gets switched with the original signal and then it's integrated. Basically what it is, is it's a 
Um, it's a crude lock-in detection technique, and all it looks for is specifically that 320 hertz, so ambient light does not affect it. And so when he was giving us the system, he had it all breadboarded up, and it was 9 by 4 inches. We shrunk it down to 2 by 2 inches and made it so it plugged in directly into our board so it functioned right. Um, to retrieve the device, we added the radio and a buzzer system, and this was our remote control for operating it. And so we got it to fit in an enclosure of two by two dimensions, so you don't have this big thing you're carrying around trying to find it. Um, it has an on-off switch, so you can turn it on and off so you're not wasting current. It has a push button to find it, and then it, uh, it transmits data to the river drifter when the button is pressed. And the, uh, the transmitter, um and receiver are the same uh, radio module that I was developing for a different class. We originally planned on using the uh, XBs for radio communication, um, and then we realized that this option costs less uh, dollars and in uh, power, so we put this on uh, both of the boards. And uh, so this one's just set to transmit. It transmits a an, uh, 18 byte packet to the receiver, so the receiver won't get interference the chances of it buzzing and going off are a lot less likely because uh, there's a checksum in there and a header, uh, a couple of header bytes in there. Uh, so yeah, that's what that guy is. And powered by a half uh, AA battery, um, since it's usually in standby mode, it'll last for a couple of months without needing a battery change. Uh, there's an 88 microcontroller on this one as well. It's a much smaller package, it's this little guy right here, uh, 4 by 4 millimeter. Uh, and then the wireless module, um, or yeah, chip, is a RFM12B. It's pretty straightforward. It's a, it uses the SPI communication. Um, you just send it a byte, uh, tell it the address you want it to send to, and then most of the phase lock loop radio communication stuff is taken care of in that, so I don't have to worry about that. And then that will go on top of the antenna. Uh, for the software, uh, here's a screen cap of the uh, software I made. Um, it saves the user settings up here, so all of the uh, uh, log files are saved in a directory and knows where to find them. Um, username and website URL are embedded into the files that uh, you'll see as Google Earth uses. And then, uh, I, um, okay, so the SD card, plug any of them in that have been uh, in the device and taken measurements, and there's a configuration file on the SD card. And uh, I'll look for all removable devices, find anything with that specific config file, and then it recognizes it. This is uh, this contains files that my software can use. So it pops up here. Um, this is the contents of the SD card. So you can pick any of these. Uh, you can delete them off the card. You can import them to save a, a copy locally on your PC. Um, load it into memory, and then you can convert it to a log file. Uh, and then here's the, the log menu interface and uh, it takes all of the raw data that isn't really human readable um, the more characters you write to the SD card the more power you're spending so we uh, just spit it all in there um, delimit it by percent signs because none of the readings use percent sign in them so uh, then I read all of that in uh, into an object and then I can create a log file that's a uh, comma, uh, comma delimited uh, CSVs um, and uh, and then you can graph it up here and you can select which attributes you want to view on the graph uh, and then there's the legend over there it tells you what unit took the measurements uh, and then the time that the device was on taking measurements up there and then you can even save that as a bitmap if you want to uh, throw it in a PowerPoint presentation or anything but mostly this is just used um, to reference which file you're looking at down here. Um, uh, I developed it in C Sharp. Uh, it was really quick and easy. Uh, all of the computers that the IHR uses are Windows machines, so I didn't have to worry about portability. Development time was really low. Didn't have to do any low-level stuff. It's just data manipulation file I.O. So C Sharp was great. And then the CSV files are ready to uh, be viewed in Excel or uploaded to SQL databases, which is what the IHR uses for all of the uh, other devices that they have, the rain meters, 
fridge sensors. Uh, they put them all in a database and they can view them from that. And then uh, the object with all the data in it will make a KML file. Uh, it's an XML scheme that Google came up with when they made Google Earth. And you can uh, plot, or when you open my file in Google Earth, it'll plot the whole route. And as you can see, uh, Devin and our sponsor went out and took measurements one afternoon. So this is, um, Burlington's about right here, right? And then down here's the airport, so you can see that it followed along in the river. And then each uh, measurement location um, embeds all of the information into it. So if you click on it, it'll pop up uh, the GPS attributes. And then there's another box with um, a, all the other measurements are embedded in a description tag. So you can view that for each point as well. Um, this is the data string we had written to the SD card. And this is what Ian used in his software. So we had a unique ID that's written at the top of each SD card so you know which device it is. And then this is just a simple uh, GPS string. And that create contains the latitude, the longitude, and some of the other stuff that we could possibly use. It also contains the date and the time that we use to set the real-time clock. And then we use the air temperature first, and then the water temperature, and then we use the date and time stamp, and then we have the water turbidity reading, and then we have our X, Y, and Z velocities. And so these are actual, the data that we collected when we took it out on the Iowa River, and so these are the temperature readings. And we put it in near the power plant, and the power plant has to regulate the temperature that it replaces the water that it brings in at. So as you can see, it's not a lot higher, but it is at about 15 degrees Celsius when it's up there. And then as it goes down the river, it slowly cools down. Uh, these are our water turbidity readings. And up here is where it's clear, and down here is where it's murky. We have the two sensors pointing at each other. So as it gets murkier, then the LED cannot pass through and get detected by the photo detector. So you can kind of see as it passes down the river how the water turbidity might vary as it goes down. And some of that will have to do if we look at the next graph with the velocity of the river. And it almost correlates. I didn't lay them over each other. But as the velocity of the river peaks, the water clarity tends to go down, which makes a lot of sense. As water moves faster, it tends to stir up more debris, which is a lot of the times where we were measuring was a lot of debris was being stirred up. And so we can see as the velocity cools down that the water becomes clearer, and as it speeds up, the water becomes murkier. Are there any questions? <laughs>